physiology pvt okay, okay. Uh, so we are going to talk about the shoulder radiology uh, thank you manish and ravi um, this is going to be a very very basic talk and the the smarter ones among you i mean talk i'm talking to the pgs might know a few things i might be emphasizing a little bit too much on some rather basic things which i think you should know and many of us even miss after 10 or 15 years of practice so this is what uh, uh, how we'll start with the x-rays i will touch a little bit about ct scan ultrasound and then we'll go about on the mri uh, manish feel free to tell me when you want me to stop so that is the one thing i want you to first start absolute zero tolerance for incorrect view you see uh, when you see, take an ap or a lateral view or a elbow wrist or a knee or an ankle it is rather easy to take but shoulder and the hip joint are the two joints which are not in the exactly transverse plane of the body so to take a good ap or a lateral view of a pelvic i mean the hip joint or the shoulder joint is rather difficult most most of the times we end up getting a bad views so please first of all develop the zero tolerance attitude for getting a good ap and a lateral view of the shoulder and we will talk about it in in a little bit detail in the next few slides if by any chance in suppose you are practicing tomorrow you have a small clinic you can't get good x rays whatever the reason is or in the institution it is not possible go get additional test either a ct scan or a mri depending on whatever is the requirement but must get at least two correct views and if you can't get some additional test done the only exception being a shoulder dislocation it may not be possible the patient is in pain and you may not be able to get all the proper test all you need to find out is where there is an associated fracture with the dislocation so just take whatever good ap and lateral view you can and as long as you have ruled out any gt fracture any surgical neck fracture go ahead and reduce it and then do whatever you want later on but except for this i would suggest that please develop an attitude of zero tolerance for incorrect views of the shoulder and what is the correct and incorrect view we are going this is what we are talk, talking about so we all know that every joint or every bone must be viewed from two directions and that these two directions uh, should be perpendicular to each other i think every pg knows everybody even a even mbbs guy is know guy knows about it that there should be two perpendicular views then what am i why am i talking about it while ap view and lateral view is not everybody knows that we need it the problem is in the shoulder it is very difficult to get and most of the times if you see you i i i uh, i tell you the tomorrow tomorrow onwards go to every shoulder patient you see you have seen operated in your in your ot or seen in your clinic and look whether they had a good ap and a lateral view most of the time what happens is in a trauma patient we move the arm either in a little bit this direction or a that direction either internal rotation external rotation and that suffices for the two views usually it is the two rotations of the arm that's it so it's the ap and lateral view of the humerus it is not the ap and lateral view of the shoulder and what you need is an ap and lateral view of the shoulder you don't need an ap and lateral view of the home humerus you will need that when you are fixing a shaft fracture of the humerus you don't need the ap and lateral view of the humerus here so what exactly the ap and lateral view a good true ap view of the humerus is like this you get a good space the glenoid is well overlapped and what i mean it by overlapping is there are two surfaces as you would know the anterior and the posterior i'm going to talk about it there's a humeral head and there's a good joint space in between the coracoid is right there in the superior one third of the joint this is the coracoid and the acromion right on the top so this is a good true ap view and i'm going to talk about it why i'm calling it a true ap view we never talk about a true ap view of the knee we never talk about a true ap view of the ankle or the elbow but why are we talking about a true ap view of the shoulder 
in a little while. And you can you must have one lateral view. Most of the institutions can do a good axillary view or a bilateral view. So I was fortunate enough to work in an institution in Gangaram where Dr. Bhasin had already done the difficult part. He had already trained and like really had them to get a good bilateral view. So by the time I came, everybody knew how a good bilateral view is done. In most of the institutions, bilateral view is not properly done. So you need to know how to get a good bilateral view. And I'm going to tell you why it is important. Of course, axillary view, most of us get it. And most of the cold cases, we get a reasonably good axillary lateral view in most of the patients. So this is how a true AP view is done. And this is how it is different. In a true AP view, the, the person is not standing flat against the wall. The shoulder is against the cassette hair, but the person is tilted about 45 degrees. So it, it's like this to give the orientation. There's a gap between the opposite side and the cassette. So by, while doing this, you get an exact true AP profile of the glenohumeral joint. You can even do it in the lying down position if the patient cannot stand, like in this position. Basically, you need a true AP view. In a regular AP view, it's actually an AP view of the chest. It is not the AP view of the glenohumeral joint. So point number one after today's class, PG class is differentiate between a true AP view and a regular AP view and learn how to get it done. Go to your radiology department, get it done yourself. So this is how a true AP view looks like. The anterior glenoid and the posterior glenoid look different. They are, they are separate and you know that this is not a good view. This is a good view. The anterior glenoid line and the posterior glenoid lines are perfectly overlapping. So you see good joint space there. And this is a true AP view. And this is exactly what I talked about. A lateral view, I think most of you would know, actually lateral view, you see a coracoid in the front, you see the acromion spine at the back, the glenoid, the humeral head. Uh, in most of the cold cases, it is rather easy to do it. Uh, and uh, we usually get it done in most of our institutions, not a problem. It helps you in seeing the anterior or posterior dislocation. This is the anterior dislocation, the humeral head has gone anteriorly. In, this is a posterior dislocation where the head has gone posteriorly. And how do I know it? Because the, this is the coracoid, the lighthouse of a shoulder joint. It tells me that the, this is the anterior and this is the posterior. So I, it tells me whether this is an anterior dislocation or a posterior dislocation. Similarly, if there is a GT fracture, you will see, uh, you will see the GT going at the back or a LT going here. So you, you will know. But what happens, and this is how you do it, I think, it, it is not very difficult to do. You, I think most of you would know it. The only problem is in some of the acute trauma patients, it is difficult to get an abduction. You need about 40 to 50 degrees of abduction. In a proximal humerus fractures, where the patient is very painful, in frozen shoulder, where it is very painful, it, sometimes it is not easy to have the patient abduct to such, such a degree of abduction. And the other thing is the camera needs to go way down. In most of the teaching institutions, the cam you have got good machines and you may be able to do it. But tomorrow when you go and have your own x-ray in your own clinic, most of the time the camera cannot go down all the way to the le level of the table to get a good axillary view. Hence, you must know how to do a bilateral view. A bilateral view, is so called because the scapula in this forms a Y. There's a glenoid in the center, there is a coracoid in the front, there's the spine of the scapula at the back, and all this makes a Y. And then the humeral head overlaps in exactly. So when it is dislocated anteriorly, that means towards the coracoid, you will see the head somewhere here. If it is dislocated posteriorly, you will see the head somewhere here. Yes. It cannot show you the GT fractures very easily because as you see, the GT is usually overlapped here. You cannot make out unless it is broadly significantly displaced superiorly, then you can see it here. But generally speaking, it gives you a good idea uh, to have a lateral view of the shoulder. And the, the good thing is you don't need any abduction, though it is a little difficult to do and 
So this is how a posterior disorder. So if you if you don't know what you are looking at, this joint looks reduced. But actually, in this AP view, the in this view, the the humeral head has gone back, and that can be seen on the Y view. You see the glenoid here, and the humeral head has gone posteriorly. This is some usually missed. So if you have a good Y lateral view, you will not miss it. So I've already talked about how a good bilateral view looks like. The scapula, the body makes uh, the body makes the big stem of the Y, and then there are the two stems of the Y, the, the spinous process and the coracoid, and the humeral head right in the center. You, all, you also can see the AC joint, but I think that will be going in too much of detail. Let's not let's miss that. Now. Coming to your exams, especially for exams, some of the examiners really like to ask about the special view. Okay, what is a striker notch view? Okay, what is a moolah view? What is a uh, 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 Bernaggio view? They were really important in those days when we didn't have when we didn't have CT scan or MRIs. Most of the times, the striker notch view or the uh, West endpoint view or the Bernaggio view are rather difficult to do because we don't them too often. We don't get so many patients of doing it. So they are difficult to reproduce too. So uh, it, it is important for you to know a couple of views like a Bernaggio view for instability, a Moolah view or a Y view or a, a there, is, there are so many, there are about 30 different views. But if you can answer the, your examiner, yes, sir, I know the striker notch view is done for hip sac lesion, but in our institution, we rely more on CT scan to de detect the glenoid or the humeral bone loss. In most of the cases, the examiners will let you go, but they just want to needle you, so you should, you should know a little bit about it. So in my practice, and um, um, I think I can talk on behalf of a few of the people here that CT scan is usually indicated in almost all displaced proximal humerus fractures. There are some old time examiners which might be offended by that. Oh yeah, you, want, you are gonna get CT scan in everybody. But I, in, in clinical practice, in, in all displaced proximal humerus fractures, it is better to get CT scan done because simply because I don't want to miss any fragment. Many a times, even in, in a big institution, if you're working there, it is difficult to get good AP lateral views and you don't want to subject the patient to go and go back again and get so many views. So CT scan gets up, give much more information and I think it is worth it. I would definitely get a CT scan done in a scapular fractures. As you know, scapula is a three dimensional bone. It's not a longitudinal bone. The glenoid, the body, the coracoid, they're all over the place. You cannot see all of them in an AP or a lateral view. So for scapular fractures, I would always get a CT scan done. In shoulder replacements, yes, but uh, I think Raman is gonna talk about it in detail. In dislocations, yes, I get a CT scan rather than MRI. And whenever I am not happy with two or three good x-rays, I'm not sure that there are not there are good AP and lateral views in my practice, I, I always try to get a CT scan just to make sure that I'm not missing on anything. So uh, if, when you are dealing with proximal humerus fractures, I think these are the most common shoulder cases you see in your hospital, in your uh, setting right now. Uh, make sure that you are getting two perpendicular views of the shoulder, not humerus. And if you are treating a, conservative, a fracture conservatively, make sure that you always get serial x-rays. Even in innocent two-part fractures, a fracture which may look good today may, may displace tomorrow. So please get serial x-rays. Ultrasound, uh, this is something most of the, I get most of the questions after my shoulder imaging uh, lecture in most of the conferences. It is good, ultrasound is rather reliable when it is done by a good person. I don't get it done because I don't know how to see ultrasound images. I don't, I don't think most of us can read ultrasound images. In only last 10 years, I have learned to read MRI images. To read ultrasound images is well nigh difficult. 
Uh, so unless you have a good ultrasonologist who you can rely on, who will pick up everything, and more, mainly in rotator cuff tear and bicep lesions, ultrasound is a good modality. If you have a good ultrasonologist, go ahead, get it done. But otherwise, in all soft tissue areas where I am not sure about my diagnosis, I go for MRI. So talking about MRI, so a couple of questions, usual questions which I ask, I'm just trying to preempt them here. Uh, a good 1.5 Tesla is good enough, definitely not a 0.5 Tesla. In smaller cities of India, still we have a lot of MRIs, even in Delhi. We have a few MRIs which are 0.5 Tesla. I don't think they are good for a small joint like shoulder. They might be good for head or spine, but for shoulder, which is a rather small joint, in fact, even for a 1.5 Tesla, a local surface coil for the shoulder is more important. Let's not get into the nitty gritty, but just for you to know that minimum must get a MRI shoulder of a 1.5 Tesla, but if there's an option, get a three Tesla MRI. When you're reading the shoulder MRI, uh, always follow a fixed protocol. And what is that protocol? First of all, make a broad clinical diagnosis in your mind. And most of the shoulder problems can broadly be classified into these three problems. Either is the subacromial space problems like impingement, rotator cuff tears, partial, complete, small, medium, large. So first make sure in your mind, what are you dealing with? Are you dealing with the rotator cuff problems? Are you dealing with a different, a, a different type of instability or something which doesn't fall into either of the two? And then there are biceps lesions. Uh, Dr. Patik has already talked about uh, all those problems. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that before you start reading MRI, in your mind, you must have some broad diagnosis which, so that you can focus on that thing. If you don't have any clue what that patient has, it will... It it is very difficult to find a problem in the MRI unless it is rather obvious, like a massive rotator cuff tear or a head dislocated, uh, chronic dislocation. You will have difficulty reading the MRI. Have some basic diagnosis in your mind. Goes without saying uh, that frozen shoulder, you don't need MRI to diagnose. There are some MRI findings in frozen shoulder, but trust me, a simple true AP and a bilateral or an axillary lateral view is good enough to diagnose the frozen shoulder. So I already talked about it. Don't report, don't read the report. Uh, um, always follow a pattern, make a diagnosis in your mind, find out what are the coronal cuts, read the coronal cuts first, then go to the axial cuts and in the end go to the sagittal cuts. And if you always follow a routine over the next six months to one year in your remaining PG time, uh, within a year or so, you will be able to read it as good as you're reading your spine MRI. I think most of the PTs are very good in reading spine MRIs, but not as much in shoulder. So what exactly is a coronal cut? Coronal cut is exactly the same as a true AP view of the shoulder. And I use this synonym just to remind me, cap, the coronal cut goes anterior to posterior. So make a picture in your mind that you are looking at AP view of the shoulder and every cut, the coronal cut, will take subsequent slices of the shoulder from anterior to posterior, about 20 or 30 slices. I'm going to show you about five or six because of the paucity of time. But if you just know that the coronal oblique cuts are basically the AP view of the shoulder, that will help you get oriented very easily. So just to get you started, this is the glenoid. This is the humeral head, rather easy to understand. This big belly, muscle belly here is the supraspinatus belly. It's coming here and attaching right there at the GT here. This is the superior labrum, the inferior labrum. These are the axillary vessels here. Usually most, you don't see much problems here. And then you see acromion or clavicle depending on which cut or which slice you're taking. Among the first few interior cuts, if you recall your shoulder anatomy, you will see the coracoid. So look for the coracoid and that will tell you that this is the interior most cut. Now, when you see the coracoid, you can 
visualize in your mind that the humor head should be somewhere here the clinoid is somewhere here and this is most probably the clavicle why it is clavicle we'll come to that later so this is uh, the the coracoid and then we'll go we'll go from there just under the coracoid is the subscap this is the subscap muscle coming from here and attaching to the lt this is the deltoid just to get you oriented as you go a little further posteriorly you will see less and less of this supraspinatus belly and more and more of the tendon you see this tendon here this black thing here is the tendon this thing is the muscle the dark black thing is the tendon attaching on the gt footprint this is the footprint from here to here it is about 1 cm beyond or lateral to the articular margin the articular cartilage ends here and it attaches somewhere here on the gt so this is what you call the footprint the where the supraspinatus or the rotator cuff muscle attaches and as i said this is the clavicle you are going a back with every uh, subsequent cut so you are just beginning to see the acromioclavicular joint the acromion is just beginning to become visible and the clavicle is right here when we go, as we go further back um, somebody is yawning anyway <laughs> so as we go further back you see more and more of acromion you see the ac joint and you see so why do you, how do i how do you make out if you if i show you just this cut how do you make out whether this is acromion or clavicle this is something uh, many times my fellow get confused so clavicle is medial to the highest point of the head this is the highest point of the head clavicle is always medial to the highest point of the head whereas the acromion is either at the highest or lateral so if you if you if you feel your shoulder or if you look at the shoulder model acromion is the lateral most structure on the roof of the shoulder whereas clavicle is medial so this is the acromion and then of course there is a suprascapular notch we are not going to that this is almost the most posterior cut right at the back of the shoulder after this you will start seeing the posterior deltoid and this is the infraspinatus tendon you see the spine of the scapula this is the acromion continuing at the spine of the scapula this is the infraspinatus coming here and attaching so there is a bit of about half to 1 1 cm of infraspinatus which you can see in the coronal cut infraspinatus is not a horizontal muscle coming behind the humeral head it is a, a bit about 1 cm of it or half cm of it comes on top of the humeral head merges with the supraspinatus tendon and attaches on the greater tuberosity here so if you see white signal here you see that means it the, the tear is extending into the infraspinatus and i'm going back to there if you see a white signal here you see, that means it's a ten, the tear of the supraspinatus after that you go to the axial cuts and just to get you oriented try to remember an axillary lateral view the ax axial cuts of the mri are just like the axial cuts of the axillary view and they go superior to inferior so you start from the top of the shoulder skin clavicle ac ac joint acromion and then tendon of the supraspinatus and then the so on and so forth so this is what i was talking about this is the spine of the scapula this is the supraspinatus uh, this is all the deltoid all around anterior posterior and the middle and this is the supraspinatus belly and going into the attaching to the uh, to the greater tuberosity as you go a little further down uh, sorry as you go a little further down you start seeing the coracoid that again is the lighthouse of the shoulder it tells you that you are in this is this all this is the anterior part of the shoulder and by corollary all this is the posterior part why it is important is once you know what is the anterior and what is the posterior on the axial cuts you will be able to know where the bank cart lesion is you will be able to see the subscap is in the anterior the posterior cuff is at the back so it will get you oriented and help you know what structure is there 
this is the glenoid, the coracoid, and the humeral head. As you go further down, you start seeing the anterior labrum. This is the glenoid, the anterior labrum, because there's a coracoid right there. You start seeing the subscap. You start seeing the infraspinatus. Infraspinatus coming here and attaching here. This is the infraspinatus tendon. This is the subscap tendon. And as you start, as you keep going further down, you see the lower and lower part of the, hum of the glenoid and the humeral head. Make sure to see where the coracoid is. It is important in more than one way. Not only it tells you that it is, this is the anterior and this is the posterior, it also tells you at what level of glenoid you are vis-a-vis -vis supra inferior. So the coracoid, you stop seeing coracoid roughly about three o'clock position. Once you stop seeing coracoid, that means now you are in the area of the Bankart lesion. So this is the glenoid, this is the anterior labrum, and this anterior labrum, if there is a tearing hair or a white signal hair between the bone and this labrum, that means there's a tear of the banka. I will just go back just to tell you something. At this level, the lesion of the labrum is not important. It can be present normally. We call it sublabral recess, foramen, or whatever you may call it. But as you go further down, where, when the coracoid is not visible anymore and the labrum is attached, that means you rule out. Another way to see whether you are further or you are sufficient down is you can see the bicipital groove. This is the, this is the GT, this is the LT, I'm sorry, and you see the biceps, tend, long end of the biceps in this. So once you see a good biceps groove, that means you are you are sufficiently down the glenoid and you can reasonably make a uh, diagnosis that is a Bankart lesion or not. If, if this is stone, it is Bankart. If this is stone, it, it is called reverse Bankart. And you sometimes you see these funny uh, bony islands in the shoulder. Don't worry about it. You go further down, you see, uh, you see bicipital groove thinning out. It's becoming more and more shallow. And this is almost about five o'clock. So you're almost at the bottom end of the glenoid in this, in this, and in this case, the labrum is securely attached to the glenoid. What are sagittal cuts important for? In most of the cases, sagittal cuts are only important to see the chronicity or how old the rotator cuff tear is. Uh, it tells you whether this rotator cuff tear is repairable or not. But just to keep it simple for you, this is the scapula. And again, you need to know which is anterior and posterior. Is this the anterior, the coracoid, or this is the anterior? A very easy thing to remember is the scapula is antiverted. I think everybody knows that. So if the scapula is tilted this way, that means this is anterior and this is posterior. So anterior is which muscle? That is the subscap. Posterior is infraspinatus anteries. And on top is the supraspinatus. So this is the supraspinatus muscle belly. This is the infra and the teres muscle belly. And this is the subscapularis muscle belly. If these muscles are not occupying the entire space, they are shrunk, it's called the muscle atrophy, indicating a long-standing old chronic rotator cuff tear. I think that is uh, enough at this level for you to understand that, okay, sagittal cuts, I will see to see whether the super rotator cuff muscles are good belly or good strength or not. So uh, just to complete it, you, you can also see the AC joint, uh, but I, and you can see the rotator cuff hood over the head. This is the spine, this is the acromion, so there's the posterior cuff, supraspinatus, and the anterior cuff. If this cuff, you see all white hair, there, here you can see the tendon. If you see all white hair, that means there is a massive rotator cuff tear involving all these muscles. So to conclude, uh, uh, I think all of us, uh, you, me, whether you're a professor, you become a professor tomorrow, or a, you go into private practice, please make sure that you learn on how to do three shoulder x-rays yourself. Most of the radiographers would not know the difference between an AP and a true AP view. They would know an axillary lateral view, but bilateral view is something most of the people don't know. 
So please make sure that you know, know how to do them yourself. If you are not able to get good views in a fractured situation, please get a CT scan done. I'm not saying that CT scan should be done in every patient, but learn to do the good shoulder exercise. But if you are not going, before you make a final decision for a treatment of a patient, get a CT scan done. For a frozen shoulder, please don't prescribe unnecessary uh, investigations. They just are not required. Not only they are not required, they will throw you off the tangent. Most of the shoulders will have some partial cuff tear. They might have a slap lesion. And then you start thinking of something else. You get all confused. Oh, this is a slap tear. Now I need to do a surgery. For a frozen shoulder, only x-ray is enough. You don't need any other investigations. If you're dealing with a recurrent dislocation of the shoulder, go for a CT scan rather than MRI if the patient cannot afford a lot of tests. In rotator cuff tears, if you are taking them for surgery, please make sure that you look at sagittal sections to see whether the cuff is really repairable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shashank, for such a nice presentation.